If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We are in the second week of looking through the book of Ecclesiastes, which is usually viewed as kind of a downer, but I'm hoping you're seeing how this book holds within it, I think, a key to setting us free from so much of the junk we live in these days. I'm going to give a little bit of the intro again that we did last week, just in case we have some people that weren't here last week, uh, really quickly, just some of the details. So Ecclesiastes is a book and is considered part of the wisdom books in the Old Testament, which is a chunk of books that have you know, a lot of poetry and a lot of wise sayings in them. And uh, traditionally, it's viewed as been written by King Solomon, who is David's son. And if you remember in um, Second Chronicles, God comes to him and says, hey, you know, what do you want? And he's like, I'd really like to have wisdom so I could rule like as a good king. And he's like, all right, great. They're like, if you ask him for that, I'll give you wisdom. But I'm also going to give you a lot of other good stuff because that was a good, you know, answer. <laughs> and so there's a rabbinic tradition that because Solomon's credit is writing several books in the Bible. And there's a kind of rabbinic tradition that the Song of Solomon book that he's, Song of Solomon, is a young man's wise book, you know, and you can read it and you'll see why. And then there's the Proverbs book, which is kind of considered in this rabbinic tradition to be like the midlife book, which shocked everyone. That's me, because I'm in my 40s. That's midlife. Some of y'all need to hear that. <laughs> then the uh, Ecclesiastes is traditionally viewed as the old man reflecting on things. And as I mentioned last week, that there's, you can see the kind of, uh, you know, there's that, like if you're going on a mountain hike, if you should like to do that sort of thing, there's like the young guy who's never done it and he's got all the new stuff. And isn't this great? We're going to go hike this mountain and everything. And he's like really excited. And then there's a the guy who's like, ha who's like at the top going, that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And then there's the old guy who's going to go, you know, if I knew then what I know now, you know, here's some things that could be helpful. And that's where this is kind of coming from. And Solomon was really successful as a king and really blessed by God and did a lot of great things. He built the temple and God's presence, and it's, it's this awesome thing. And, um, and so he is writing from a place of experience and maybe extreme experience even. Like he was very wealthy, successful, popular, and able to do – he's like the top of everything. And so when he's saying these things – He's saying them because he knows. He's already been there. And the main point of this whole book would be something like, you know, a person can only find meaning in God alone and not in earthly possessions or pleasures. And that's kind of the whole takeaway to hold on to because uh, that, that he's going into details. And that today is going to be, this week uh, is going to be a lot of details. And he's, it starts with, and he recurringly uses this phrase, which is translated meaningless. And it's a Hebrew word, havel, which means vapor or smoke. And so it's kind of talking about how, like, vapor just appears and it's gone. There's not a lot to grab onto. And as I mentioned before in the book of James, you would remember that God, this is an image that's throughout the Bible that um, in the book of James it refers to our life this way. Why do you not even know what, what oh, say, why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And so this idea of the, you can't quite grab it or get a hold of it. Yet yeah, we do. And then he also talks about chasing after the wind a lot, which is an image for something you can't catch, you just can't do. You know, it's chasing after nothing in a sense. And uh, I want to say that today I talked about other things last week. We're going to kind of emphasize little different things each week. This one I think that you'll see in these chapters we're going to go through today it helps us to resist this temptation to settle for overly simplistic answers, okay? Simple answers are great when they're right, you know, and Jesus actually gives quite a few of those. Like when people ask him, I'll ask him a really deep question to throw him off, and he gives them like a really simple answer that they're like, oh. So simple answers are not bad, they're fine, but simplistic ones are, where you don't account for everything, and you just throw out, you know, this is it. You know, this is how the world works. This book kind of helps meddle with that a little bit because um, cause that's not how the world works. You know, it's like it's, like it's just fake. So um, I did say something wrong last week, which is I'm glad I caught. Uh, I said we were doing chapters one through four last week, and I made a reference that, one, that chapter four was kind of a recap of the first three chapters. I actually meant and kind of did just cover chapters one through three, and then this week we're doing four through six. So we get to go through four as the recap, so it's kind of good. <laughs> so just to be clear, last week was one through three, this week is four through six, next week is seven through nine, and then we'll have another 10 through 12, which is still kind of a lot, okay? But there's repetitive things in here, so we're going to get moving. Um, and today's going to be a little bit like a Bible class because we're just going to read it, 
and then I'm going to make some notes as we go along, okay? So it would be almost like we're just taking a Bible study class, which is fine, because we like that, right? And uh, what I want you to think about today is, uh, like I said, there's details. So I see us in our culture as kind of chained up, covered, like bogged down, like Jacob Marley and the um, Christmas Carol. And of course, I use the Disney one because it's the best one, even though the Muppet people are going to be mad right now. I'm fine with the Muppet one. The Disney one's better. But the, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding, whatever. It's the one you grew up with as kids. So this is the one I grew up with. So goofy as Jacob Marley, where we're chained up by these things. And I think within Ecclesiastes, you start to find a lot of the specific keys to a lot of the stuff that's chaining a guy like that up. You all all know the story, you know. And so you can unlock things. So as we're going through this today, it's almost going to be like a whole bunch of little mini messages. Like if you were doing like some sort of, you know, I don't know, podcast or daily email, you would like do one at a time. But here we are, we're going to do them all. So, but one of these might really stick to you, and that's the one you need to focus on because that's the one God's talking to you about. And it may not be for your neighbor or even your spouse or anything. But look for the keys as we read, okay, guys? And one other thing I want to say is that, um, I mean, think about this because I think it's affected me in such a way that my dad, we grew up, my dad's a cinematographer in Hollywood. And so I have a cool photo of him that we can use. There we go. That's him when he was like my age, when he was middle-aged, <laughs> sitting on a crane. So this matters today be, and as we go through this book for a couple reasons. One, that my exposure to Hollywood growing up was a lot. And when you go through like, you know how people are when we were reading this book and it's like, Hollywood is like all of those things, usually on steroids. And it's not to say, like, the whole world is this way, but these people are, like, specifically flamboyantly this way. You know what I mean? They're, it's all about this kind of stuff. And so it makes me kind of sensitive to some of these things. But the other thing it made me, uh, I'll show you, this is another thing, just this is a side note, really. It really makes me personally sensitive, just so you understand where I'm coming from, to, like, show business stuff within the church, which is, like, why we don't have the lights and stuff here. It's not because we're against cool lights. It's just because I have a hard time with it. It doesn't mean it's wrong. You see what I mean? It's kind of maybe just from my upbringing. Jeff and I would always talk about this kind of stuff that, like, <laughs> it's not all bad, you know, like, gosh, man, you know, it's, but it's, it's hard for me personally. So when I start to feel like church is a performance, it shuts me down. So years from now, if I'm not here anymore and everybody wants to get cool lights, that's fine. And, but just for now, you're going to have to bear with the bare lights. However, we'll put cool lights in the youth room so y'all can, you know, my hypocrisy only goes so far. That's from Tombstone, if anybody. Did anybody know that was? Okay, you knew. How, you, all the guys my age were like, yeah! <laughs> you, you'll be fine with all my references today because they're all for like 40-year-old guys. But the main thing is, the, the Hollywood, this thing is, we're always sensitive to the stories that we pay attention to, right? The stories we live by and the stories we believe in. And those are the things that start to make a lot of those chains. You know what I mean? The, the specifics of it might be related to or all about achievement or money or the kinds of things he addresses. But it builds into our lives a story that we believe about ourselves, and it ends up trapping us. And I'm very sensitive to those kinds of things because I'm very aware of how powerful they are and how, for some reason, we all like to pretend like they don't exist. Because there's this other kind of overarching story that, well, I just live my life and do whatever I think. And you're like, no, you don't. There's all sorts of things that you believe about yourself that you inherited because you're American or you grew up in the era you grew up in or you grew up with the parents that you had that were great or the parents you had that were terrible. And these things mess up people for their whole lives. Now, Jesus is coming to undo these sorts of things, but we're trapped by them and we don't even realize that we are, right? And that's the whole Jacob Marley thing is he doesn't realize until after he's dead and he's like, you know, we shouldn't have done what we did, you know, and so this is a chance to get free from some of this sort of stuff. And so I'm going to be emphasizing storylines today because I think a lot of the storylines, especially a couple of them that are becoming dominant these days, are pretty bad and pretty destructive, meaning something like this, like we're defined by our politics and those who think differently than we do are not just wrong but completely evil. I would say that's a storyline that's out there in the world today, and we're all being bombarded with it on a daily basis. That not, the people who disagree with me not are only seeing things from a different point of view. They're literally evil and have to be destroyed. That's not true. I'm not saying there aren't people that are evil. I'm just saying that storyline is not true. And we have to resist it or else we start to do really bad things. And I can refer to World War II if you want, but I think you already know. So let's get into Ecclesiastes 4. Ecclesiastes 4 okay? 
So like I said, I'm just going to read. Again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they had no comforter, and the power on the side of the oppressors, and they had no comforter, and declared, the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive, better than both of the one who's never been born, who, not, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. So what he's saying here in this first section is how, how much evil he's seeing in the world and how he can't cope with it. And then he's making a hyperbolic statement about it. It's better if people weren't even born than to encounter this stuff because it's so evil. It keeps going. I, and I saw the toil and all the achievements spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. He's like saying so much of what we do is just keeping up with the Joneses. And it has no even real purpose or point other than just that, envy and, and, uh, of another person. And fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. That's a summary of that whole thing where he's saying better to be content with what you have than to be just striving so much to accomplish these other things that don't have any meaning to them. So it's, it's a turning of focus. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother, and there was no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless and miserable business. These are all just re-saying the same sort of thing. That's just like, you know, what are you even doing this for? And you don't even stop to evaluate it. And it reminded me of when Paul talks about being content in all things in Philippians 4, because Paul the Apostle was going around telling people about Jesus and all this kind of stuff. And he says this, so I'll read this to you. For I learned to be content whatever the circumstances, for I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, that last bit, everybody's heard a million times. Like, that's the one that gets on, like, the, the calendar or something like that. But what he's talking about, he's saying, I, because I know who Jesus is and I know who I am because of that, can be content in any situation. And he's like, and I've been there. He's not just saying theoretically. He's saying, yeah, I've done this. And we can do this too. And it's important we say this because depending on what part of the church you come from, there's people that just tell you, if you follow Jesus, you're going to be totally healthy and have tons of money. And that's like the extreme version of it. But there's like a softer version of it that's just like everything's going to be great. And if you're experiencing something bad, that means something's wrong with your faith. or so. it's like, And it's just totally twisted. This is one of those lies. This is a key. Like, no, you're going to experience bad things because you're alive in this fallen world. But Jesus is giving us the keys to not be controlled by it, not to totally not experience bad things, right? And we're going to move into another kind of section, a different idea. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls down and has no one to help him up, help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Summarizing this whole chunk, it's saying that you can't do life by yourself, right? And you remember when we talked in 1 Corinthians about the body of Christ and the many parts and the different parts that, like, you know, you might be a hand, I might be a foot or whatever, and you need everybody else because otherwise you're just a foot, which is not that great, you know? And so... You often hear this applied to marriage. Like, this is one of those ones they read at a wedding. And it's fine. It's fine to apply this to marriage because if you're getting married and if you are married, your spouse is like the key relationship, the key other person in your life, right? So it's, a poor, a, it's, import, or it's fine to reference it in marriage, but it's not talking about marriage. This is talking about people and other people. And so a single person is exactly, this is exactly, this is the same for everybody. We need each other to do this Christian thing. And I think it's important in this day and age as we get more and more fragmented into our phone world and like siloed off and worried that everything can hurt us all the time. You know, you have to remember, it's like, I need other people to actually be able to do this thing. That's what this is. Like, is a li Christian life together. Otherwise, it's just not, you can't do it. And also, I made a note in here that if, you, if, you, if you're wondering about that marriage thing, you can read in 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about it. He's like, it's, in his opinion, it's better to not even be married because of this, like, what he's doing and all this kind of stuff. And now that marriage is wrong, he says that, you know. But uh, we're not going to hung up on that. This is not a marriage verse specifically. 
And then he gets into this. Advancement is meaningless. Better, better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to heed a warning. The youth may have come from prison to the kingship, or he may have been born in poverty within, this king, within his kingdom. I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before him, but those who came later were not pleased with the successor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. This is... This is kind of, you could apply this in a lot of different ways, but the main thing that you, I think I could take away from this today is that there's always someone else coming up. You know, that even if you are the guy, you're not going to be the guy for very long, and there's another the guy. And that made me think back, y'all remember the, the Kobe LeBron thing back when it was like uh, Kobe LeBron thing? <laughs> and, uh, and it was like, well, this guy's better than that guy, and that guy's And people were like, well, you know, Kobe. And there was all this, you know, argument on the thing. And I remember sitting there, because I'm not like a huge basketball guy, but I grew up when this guy was the main guy. And to people my age, it's like, that's the guy, right? But even this guy, <laughs> that's Michael Jordan, in case you didn't know. Yet. But even this guy probably didn't have the swagger of this guy who was before him. And, uh, and it, you could just kind of keep doing this, and you get the point that all these guys were the guy, you know, but then there's always another guy, and there's going to be another guy, and there's always going to be another guy. And so putting importance into that is the meaningless thing. It's not saying it's bad. Like, there's going to be a guy. There's always going to be the best player in the NBA, and there's always going to be debates about that, and it's, or who's the, the goat, you know, or whatever. Um, but the point is putting meaning into that is the problem. And in a, in, a, in a related way, this is why we shouldn't elevate Christian leaders. Hello? Like, we need people to do things. Like, somebody needs to be up here talking right now before we can... But, like, it doesn't mean I'm any better than anybody else. Or, But it's not... I don't think we struggle here. I think we struggle with the guys on TV and stuff like that. There ain't any different, you know? And we shouldn't elevate them that way. But maybe in a more applicable way, I think there's a storyline that... Especially parents. And there's probably a version of this that we all struggle from. This is important. I think... There's a whole lot of things that come my way that tell me something like, if I don't get my kids in the best school or the best neighborhood or on the best team, that I've ruined their entire lives. Does anybody hear this kind of stuff or feel this kind of stuff? Like, if they don't get this thing, you have ruined their entire life. And you're like, whoa, I don't want to ruin, you know. And then you do things you would probably never do because of this false story, you know. And it's like, it dawned on me as like, what if none of that is true? Or so, so little of it. Like the, here's the thing, guys. There's things that can be partially true. We all know this. But that story isn't true. It feels true probably to the young person. And they might have an excuse. And it might feel still sort of true to somebody my age because I'm not quite sure, but I'm starting to doubt it. But the old guy is telling us that's not true. And one of the old guys just said amen in the middle there. So... <laughs> Sorry you're the old guy now, but, the, uh, but that's life as well. There's always another guy. But the, uh, it made me think of, I'm going to quote a lot of people this morning. There's a line in a Paul Simon song that's in one of his newer songs called Getting Ready for Christmas Day. It came out in like, it's not one of his old songs. That's why you're like, why have I never heard this? It's from 2011 or something. And he says this, if I could tell my mom and dad that the things we never had never mattered, we were always okay. There's, I feel that we spend so much time worrying about and engaging with things that just don't matter. And there he is summing it up in one line. Because when you think back on your childhood, how many of the best schools did you go to? And even like, I can prove how wrong this is. Like, in order for there to be a best school, which would be one, how, what are the other schools? Not the best. And you see how, like, that one school can, how many people can that hold? A thousand? And how many students do it? You see, you see, this doesn't make any sense at all. And the point is really this. I didn't go to the best school, and I didn't need to. And you probably don't either. You probably need to get educated. You know what I mean? You see, and that's a school thing. But, like, you know, you probably don't need to live in the best neighborhood. You know, like, kind of jerks usually live there anyway. But the point is, like... <laughs> They're not all jerks. But the point is, the, uh, <laughs> like, 
this you're starting to apply it now, and you're seeing. And you, I don't need to waste time. You get it. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes five. Now we're starting to talk about God here. So he's like he's shifting gears. Remember I said it's a lot of mini messages. So hold on to that. You probably don't need the best things. You just need some things, and you'll be all right. All right. Moving on. Ecclesiastes five, talking about God. God, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to. Go near to listen rather than to offer sacrifice of fools <laughs> who do not know what they are doing wrong, what they do wrong. Let me just read that again because I read it bad. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they are doing or gosh, who do not know that they do wrong. The sacrifice of fools, people who don't know they do wrong. Don't be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven, and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Did some of y'all remember that song? Well, let my words be few. And you're like, oh, that's nice and sweet. <laughs> do, do you know where that came from? <laughs> Jesus, I am so in love with you. Anyway, so the, uh, don't be quick with your mouth and be hasty in your heart. To utter anything before God. God is in heaven, and you are on earth, so let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares, and many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Many words mark the speech of a fool, and he has, God has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. This is simple, pretty clear. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. So don't say you'll do things that you're not going to do. And do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why, God, why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. So that's the God chunk in here. I think this is a good reminder uh, in our day and age especially. We should take God seriously. And uh, God being God and all can't not be uh, taken seriously. Like it's kind of an impossibility. You know, like when we're going through the book of Exodus and God's presence comes on the mountain and everything like that, that's just who God is. And that his name, I am who I am, he just, he can't not be things, you know. So God is serious. The problem we have is we usually take God not seriously and take ourselves way too seriously. So I, I mentioned this a little bit when we talked about our, our verse, like as a theme of our church, <laughs> this is what we want to do. We want to take God seriously and not take ourselves too seriously. doesn't mean we have to be goofy all the time, but, you know, it's not about us, you know. We're not the guy, you know. But also this, there's a certain thing about God, like us saying things to God and not meaning it. And, you know, God is, it says that the God's least intelligent thought is more intelligent than any thought any human has ever had. So it's not that God is dumb, okay? But God is just truthful and, and pure, and he takes things seriously. G.K. Chesterton talks about this in his uh, in his book, uh, the Orthodoxy. There's this interesting section, and he's not exactly addressing this, but you'll get the point that I'm going to make. I'm just going to read this whole thing. Because he starts comparing, you know, we talk about childlike faith and becoming like a child to even come into the kingdom of heaven and all this kind of stuff. He's reflecting on that. And this is a smart guy, smart British guy. Um, and so, because children have abounding vitality, because they're in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For <laughs> All the dads laughed at that, yeah. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all the daisies alike. It may be that God makes every da daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that God has eternal appetite of infancy. This is what is starting to apply to what we were just reading. It may be that God has the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. That's pretty good stuff, isn't it? Yeah, y'all might want to read that book. But the point is, just say what you're going to do and be honest, because we, 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 we're tricking ourselves. You think God doesn't know? He knows. 
Just speak clearly. Because he loves us, which is, you know, the rest of the Bible. But take God seriously. This is not like, love doesn't mean not serious. They're not mutually exclusive. I actually think they overlap. But yes, orthodoxy, you might want to read it. Then he goes into this. Riches are meaningless. If you see the poor oppressed in a district, and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by another higher one, and over them both are other higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all, and the king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money, here's the thing. Whoever loves money never has enough. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is meaningless. And this is the movie Citizen Kane. If you haven't seen this, it's worth watching because that's what the whole movie's about. This guy becomes the most powerful person, most richest person, da 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 and then die. I don't want to tell the end because it'll ruin it. But, like, you know, he's not happy. <laughs> all right? I'll just say that. And uh, I, it's like we all know this, but unless we see it in an extreme version... We think it doesn't apply to us or something like that. Well, I'm not rich, but we're still driven by this thing. You know, it's like, have you ever stopped and asked the question, what would be enough? I don't hear anybody really talking like that. I'm not saying we don't ever talk like that. I'm just saying it's not a normally encouraged way to talk. You know, what would be enough? You know, enough anything. 11, and this is where it goes. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them. The sleep of a laborer, though, is sweet, Whatever they, even whether they eat little or much. But as for rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. This is summed up by the notorious B.I.G. as mo money, mo problems. And that's the truth. And we all know it. I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. So it's like not only are you never satisfied, there's sometimes when people hoard things so much that they actually harm themselves by it. Or wealth lost through some misfortune so that when they have a children, there's nothing left for them to inherit. So you do everything, chasing after the wind, right, and one thing goes wrong and it's all gone. This is why he's revealing the meaninglessness of this whole thing. And then he says this, Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and, every, and as everyone comes, so they depart. That's what you come in with. That's what you leave with. All the stuff in the in-between, you don't get to keep. It became very apparent to me because, like, my grandmother's house, I had mentioned recently, you know, she passed away. And that house had literally not changed my entire life or my entire, like, mom's life. They did move in when my mom was, like, a little kid. But they, like, bought a couch. And back then you bought furniture that you could, like, recover and stuff. It wasn't all Ikea and all. So, like, that couch, I think they got recovered in the 80s. But, like, it had been there since... Whenever they moved into the house, you know. So my entire life, the, nothing had changed. And they got a new TV, like, once. But the, uh, it was like that, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, she's dying, and they were taking everything out of the house. And it was a really weird experience because you're like, this was such a stable thing, you know. They'd be like, well, you know, death, taxes, in my grandmother's house, you know, or whatever you would say. You know, it's just, it never changed. And then all of a sudden, it was very changed. And it dawned on me, like, you know, here's this thing that this has been my grandmother's thing her, my whole life, and now it's at my house or my cousin's house. Like, you don't, I knew this, but I never thought, it's like, you don't really own anything. You just kind of borrow it for a while. And then somebody else in your family has to throw it out, you know, because you kept too much of it, you know. <laughs> that was more my granddad's stuff in the basement than my grandmother's, but. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and, every, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. So what do they gain since their toil for the wind? He's talking about the grievous evil being if you live under the chains of this chasing and, you know, one day I'll be something. One thing this will matter. One day. It's like, you know. And then he gets into one of the punchlines. And their day, all their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. It's like, to what end? And then he says this. This is what I've observed to be good. And you'll remember these from last week. There was a handful of these. Same, same thing again, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun for the, during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. That's what he observed to be good. I'm going to read that again. All, the wise man in the Bible, this is what's good, right? 
that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions of any amount, okay, and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot, and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. I think we should act like that's a gift from God. Like when Paul talks about being content in all things, he's understanding this, just phrasing it a different way. He even says this, they seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. They're not always like, well, you know, it used to be this and da-da-da-da-da. You know, they're like, oh, they're, I, I say this, this is Garth from Wayne's World says to Wayne, live in the now. <laughs> this, is the, this is the struggle <laughs> to live in the now. Like they're, they're present, you know. Let me go into the last chapter here. Live in the now. Y'all haven't seen that, have you? These kids have you you've seen it? I'm proud of you. Well done, parents. I guess I should think about what's in these movies before I talk about them, so like, you know. <laughs> read some review or something before you All right. Ecclesiastes six, one. I have seen another evil under the sun. It weighs it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor, so they lack nothing their hearts desire but does not grant them the ability to enjoy it. And strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. Just talking about like some people actually get everything and can't enjoy it. This is another Citizen Kane moment, and we all know this, but just because we're not as extreme as this, we're like, well, that's that guy. So it's us guy as well, you know. A man may have a hundred children and live many years. This is an example kind of of what he's talking about. And yet, no matter how long he lives, if he can't, cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. This is, again, the hyperbolic statement. It comes without meaning. It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity. Do not all go to the same place? And this is a, this made me think of Ebenezer Scrooge, which I will reference again in the Disney version just because we were there already, that this life comes without meaning. If he, if he doesn't have a proper burial, which is actually a scene in this book, even though it's a cartoon as well, you know, it's like nobody even comes, you know. And he's talking about it comes without meaning. This living this way doesn't accomplish anything. And it actually would be better if you weren't even alive, you know, as a hyperbolic expression, not literally. Okay? You have to understand that. And it makes you ask the question, what and who are you living for? And you see this when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? Because the answer is in this book, and it's in the rest of the Bible, where they're like, what's the greatest commandment? Because the answer to this, like if we were in a Sunday school class right now, they're like, what do you think you should be living for? And you're like, God? Yes, this is that's the right answer. So, but when Jesus is asked what's the greatest the greatest commandment, they're like he's like to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And they're like, wow, yeah. And he's like, and the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So, living for God and for other people is the meaning of life. How you get there is difficult. That's what Jesus is showing us and giving us. I thought of another quote from the 90s that is from Braveheart where Mel Gibson says that's William Wallace because William Wallace did not say this. Every man dies, but not every man truly lives. And that's a good summary of this. Easy to remember. Thank you, Mel. Let me keep reading. Verse 7. Everyone's toil is for their mouth, yet their appetite is never satisfied. You're going to be hungry again. So being led around by your desires isn't going to lead you anywhere other than more hunger. What advantage have the wise over fools? What do poor gain by knowing how to conduct themselves before others? Better what the eye sees, meaning what you have, than a roving appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. It's like this contentedness is again being illustrated here. Content in what you have, where you are, the things God has you doing, even the bad things. He uses the word toil after all. You know, I know most of us, most human beings don't live in a situation where their daily life is fulfilling. Okay? 
most of us live in a like where toil is it a good appropriate word to describe the things we spend our time doing. And he says in this, he doesn't go, let me tell you how to escape the toil. He talks about embracing it into some transformational way. It's deeper than just getting away from it all the time. That's part of the chasing after the wind. It's like, that's not even real. Live in the now, be there, and let God transform it. I'm not saying that's easy to do. It's not. But that's the direction towards wholeness and healthy living and Christ-likeness. Kayla, you can come on up here. But what the eye sees, uh, better what the eye sees than the roving appetite, this too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named. And what humanity is has been known. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. I don't know all of the meaning hidden in that verse, but I think it's pretty interesting that whatever exists, somebody's already seen before. It's already been named. You're not the first person there, you know. At best, you're like one of those guys that's the first person to find one of those, uh, like, in Egypt, like they're digging up, like, an ancient burial site. Like, nobody's been here for 3,000 years. I was like, yeah, but somebody was there. You know what I mean? Like, at best. But j- probably, like, you're more like, Elijah's like, is there anyone left? And God's like, I got a lot of people that are thinking that. You know what I mean? It's like, this is you're not the only person, you know. And what humanity is has been known, you know, even God now, Jesus came as fully man. He fully knows what it's like to feel the things that we feel, to be forgotten, to be overlooked, to be the person who doesn't get picked, or to be the person who experiences a lot of injustice or whatever. He knows what it feels like. He's, so he's, when, he, when God's saying things to us, he's not saying them theoretically. He's saying them because he knows. Jesus knows. The Son of God, God in the flesh. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. There's times when stronger people win because no one can contend with someone that's stronger. That doesn't mean they're right. There's going to be times when something gets settled, and it's just because the stronger people won. That winning doesn't always mean that it was right, and it certainly doesn't mean that it was God. You know, we often are like, well, that happened. That must have been what God wanted. Not exactly, or the story's not over yet. You know, there's this kind of aspect to the whole thing. Sometimes strong people just win because they're stronger. In fact, they always do. Look a little deeper. And then we get into this. The more the words, the less the meaning. (sighs) (laughs) The more the words, the less the meaning. And how does that profit anyone? I think most podcasts and talking heads fit this category. So fill in the blank. More wor- more of the words, the less the meaning, and how does that profit anyone other than the person talking? For who knows what is good for a person in life during the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow? Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they are gone? And then it's we're going to stop there. It's just, that's the to be continued. I was reading some books. I started this year off. Two of them got recommended to me. One of them I was reading for some personal reasons. But all three of these books are kind of the same sort of thing. They're, they're um, biographies and an autobiography. The first one is called A Burning in My Bones by Eugene Peterson. Oh, it's not by Eugene Peterson. It's about Eugene Peterson, written by another guy. But he interv- it was like his biography. So they had a lot of interviews before he died. Then he died. And then the guy wrote the book, right? The second one was called The Way It Was, and it's about John Wimber, who's the guy who founded the Vineyard Church, and he kind of was dying of cancer and got together with his wife, and then his wife wrote it when he died. And then the third one is called My Not All, what is it? All, I can't, All My Knotted Up Life by Beth Moore, and that's actually an autobiography, and she's still alive. So, (laughs) point is, these are all in their own vein kind of famous-y Christian people, right? Beth Moore probably more famous than the rest, but Eugene Peterson, uh, did a Bible paraphrase translation. We read a little bit from it last week called The Message. And he became like at like 70 or 75 years old, like really famous and was like, whoa, what, what, you know? But he he was a Presbyterian pastor for his whole life. Um, he ended up teaching some at a seminary and some stuff like that. But John Wimber was a, uh, uh, he was actually a, music, a musician. He was, he organized some music groups. He was not a believer. And he actually put together the Righteous Brothers and dropped out right before they, 
<laughs> release the you got that loving feeling song. And uh, but he, I think he was even involved in that to some extent. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, he came to know the Lord in that time. But he had a Quaker church, and he was a Quaker for his whole, you know, time. And uh, eventually, they kind of kicked, you know, they got separated, and he started the Vineyard Church, which was hugely impactful to all of the charismatic church and beyond. They they kind of helped normalize a lot of the music stuff we do these days. And um, and then Beth Moore is Beth Moore. Everybody knows Beth Moore. She's written so many Bible studies, and she's famous all over. Um, and here's what was weird about these books. These people are so not the same. Their backstories weren't the same. They're, but they had, like, the same story points. And the biggest one is these people are messed up. Like, their lives are messed up. And I'm talking about, like, while they were famous Christian people, their lives are messed up. Some of it's their own fault. Some of it's not their own fault. Most of it, in these people's case, wasn't their own fault. Like, things just happen because we live in a fallen world, you know? And they encounter just as many bad things as I do, where you do, or some of them might encounter more. I mean, we're, all our lives aren't the same. But it's super encouraging to me because also all three of these people found in some way, in whatever way you would measure, some sort of success. You know, like for a period of time, they would be what you would call famous. You know, Beth Moore still is, and she's still alive. But when you read through their book, these aren't books that other, other people were helping, but it's kind of their book. They have to acknowledge it because that's part of their life, but it's so underemphasized by how much people would care. You know, they were like, yeah, then we wrote, then we wrote this is one Bible study, and for some reason, everybody wanted to read it, you know. Or Eugene Peterson was like, I did this thing because some people asked me to, and for some reason, everybody wanted to read it, you know. And then it kind of messed things up. Like, <laughs> it was a better perspective of some of the stuff we're seeing in Ecclesiastes is that sometimes when you get that thing that they've been telling you you want your whole time, your whole life, it's not even great. And these people were just kind of, I don't know, aware enough to share that kind of thing. And it sticks out to me because uh, so much of church life is built on this unspoken or maybe sometimes spoken idea that the closer you are to God, the more your life has no problems in it, or the more perfect you always are, or, I mean, we, no one actually thinks this, but we all seem to think it all the time, you know, and we don't really care about Eugene Peterson. Like, I, I don't spend, like, yeah, I wonder what Eugene Peterson was thinking. You know, it's like, I don't, no one thinks like that. I don't, I, don't, I really hope you don't. But what we do usually do is think about ourselves, where we go, I'm not like that guy who da 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 da, because then and then and then, and everything you're saying is probably made up. You know, it's an illusion, because that's not even what this person's life's really like. And if you want to know sort of what their life's like, read the book, but that's not even really what their life was like. This is just a book, you know? These people are just at least honest. And um, so we allow the deceiver, the enemy, to speak to our mind and tell us, this is your fault, you're broken, da-da-da, about everything, or that you deserve this, or blah, 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 you know, and God can't do this in your life. You'll never, nothing will ever change, you know, and, and, and then also tell us through, you know, images on social media or something like that, everybody else has got it worked out. You're the only one. You're just messed up or screwed up and too bad, you know, and then we spiral into this weird despair thing, and there's there's, we all have our individual versions of it. And <laughs> the beauty of it is that none of it's true. The, the sadness of it and the, 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 the pain of it to me is that these chains that we carry around control so much of our lives. The sadness is they're meaningless. It doesn't mean they're not real. They're just meaningless. And there are moments, and there's testimony. You know it. You've been there. Some of us have been there, and we talk about it. There's moments when you step into the presence of God, or God touches your life in some way, where they're gone. Well, there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. And they're gone. And you're like, 
oh, this is what we're supposed to be like. This is what life is supposed to be like. And then for some reason, we pick them back up and wrap back up in these things. And one day, when Jesus returns and, we're, and there's a new heaven and a new earth, and there's no more crying and pain, and he wipes away every tear from their eye, we won't have these chains anymore. But I do think we'll look back at the meaninglessness of it. Why did I spend so much time caring about that? And why did I spend so much time worrying about this when I have the opportunity to lay it down and stop? And this is spiritual stuff, and it will have an impact spiritually and even resistance spiritually. That's just how this world works. But that's what, that's what remember in Ephesians, you're supposed to, the, we need this armor of God to stand against the works of the enemy because they're real. And these are some of the big ones that are working. I said this is a resistance to simple answers. Simple answers that overly, not simplistic answers, not simple, like overly simplistic things that like boil down complex things in the world to simple black and white statements that aren't true anymore because they've been so, you know. And what we can find is... uh, the meaninglessness of these simple answers that can become chains even is something inside of this like this. We aren't supposed to be able as humans to find out who we are on our own. Like it's never been part of the whole thing. Like God didn't make us to go like, all right, go off and figure out what you're doing and what you're supposed to be and who you are and why you exist and all these sorts of things. We've been trying to do this. We all try to do it in our own sort of way. Some of us even try to like do that in a Christian way, which is weird. But you can't do it. You aren't supposed to do it. It was never anything we were ever intended to do. We will find out eventually that all that struggling is meaningless. But like I said last week in the, in the verse that we read, that eternity, God put that eternity in our hearts. Like we all know there's something wrong with all this. We all know this isn't how things are supposed to be. And we know that something like's got to change, and we and maybe some of us can even go something will change, or did, or I don't know, you know. And we see that God's answer to that in Jesus and what Jesus did. And we just went through the Gospel of Mark, so I don't need to go through it all. But you see it summarized in Romans five because this is it. Jesus, God doesn't give simple answers. He doesn't just go, yeah. He gives real answers to real problems, and He can handle your real questions. Romans 5 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet for, for sorry, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. And so the encouragement is to both realize, in maybe one of the many messages that we went through, that this thing, this particular thing is meaningless and needs to be set aside or set free from, but that also that God can handle, usually that stuff comes from, it's in some sort of protective way. I feel safer with this chain than I do finding out what it's like without it. Because that brings up questions I don't know if I can answer. And the, the truth to that is you may not be able to, but you're not going to confuse God. God knows the answer and he can handle the questions. And you see in the actions of Jesus to the human problem that's existed from all eternity or whatever since the fall of man, the brokenness that we brought into the universe and sin and all this sort of thing, that Jesus comes as God on our behalf and dies for us, that's the solution. He's not giving cheap answers. He's willing to die for it. So he has at least the right to speak on that behalf. Andy, would you come up here? I need your help reading this. This all bring to, brought me to the kind of emotion that's expressed in this Psalm, Psalm 42, which has a lot of f- famous parts in it. But I'm going to invite Andy to read this at the end here uh, in kind of closing. And why don't we stand to read this? And if you are in need of prayer, we're going to try this today. The prayer team, don't have you guys come up by these doors again, not in the back corner. So if you need prayer, our prayer teams will be up by these two front doors. Um, and if you want to spend time at the altar, just doing some business with God alone, that's fine as well. Um, and then also this, 
We're going to have this area up here be a place where people can pray and some, do some business with God. So if you, after Andy reads, that'll be, we'll have them sing, and that'll be kind of the closing of everything. And we all like to hang out and talk, which is good. But let's keep some space for, from the front just because people might be dealing with some things. And uh, we'll do that. Amen. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from the Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of the waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs His love. At night His song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So let me pray. So, Father, I pray that as the deep of our hearts calls out to the deep that you answer with, that we would receive it and bring peace and healing and the freedom from chains to all who are here in Jesus' name. So if you need prayer.